Welcome again, everybody. Here's a very good and practical case that's very important to seniors and juniors alike. This is an eight-year-old uh, male patient uh, who had uh, trauma to the elbow. Here you're looking at the lateral elbow x-ray. And here's the uh, anteroposterior radiograph of the same elbow. Now, before we look at that case, let's look at a normal elbow radiograph in an adult patient. So that was a pediatric case. This is an adult patient. Uh, let's start with this normal AP radiograph of the elbow. From here, we're gonna go to the lateral afterwards to make things more clear and easier. You're looking here at the humerus. This is the radius, and this is the ulna. Of course, the radial bone in an anatomical position is lateral, while the ulna is medial. Starting by the easiest bone, this is the radius with the radial head here. The proximal anatomy of the ulna is easier to see on the lateral radiograph, but let's finish that here, then we'll go correlate that with the lateral radiograph. So the proximal ulna has a more anterior projection which is called the coronoid process. While it has a more posterior projection, this here, which you see on top of the uh, humerus, which is called the olecranon. Now look carefully, you'll notice that there's an area here that looks darker or lucent comparison to the rest of the bone. So this part of the distal humerus uh, is actually lucent because there is an anterior and posterior groove or fossa. The anterior fossa fits the coronoid process, and that's why it's called the coronoid fossa. The posterior fossa fits the olecranon, and that's why it's called the olecranon fossa. They'll be easier to see on the lateral projection, but this is where you expect them to be seen on a frontal projection. To complete the important anatomy, there are four rounded projections or bumps in the distal humerus. The first here, which is parallel to the radius, is called the capitellum. The second rounded projection here, which is uh, along the line of the ulna, is called the trochlea. Now we're left with two projections, one on the lateral and one on the medial aspect of the distal humerus. Since these are above the trochlea and capitellum, we call these the epicondyles. So this is the lateral epicondyle and this is the medial epicondyle. One of the important uh, landmarks to make sure that the alignment is maintained, meaning that there is no dislocation, is that the radial head is always opposing the capitellum. And that's what they call the radiocapitellar line. This radiocapitellar line should be maintained in any projection that you're looking at, whether it's this frontal projection or the lateral projection that we're going to check in a while. Now let's look at the same anatomy on a normal case on the lateral projection. It's a bit easier now. This is the radius, this is the ulna, and this is the humerus. Here you have the radial head, this is the radial neck, and this is the radial shaft. And as you notice, the radial head is opposing a rounded structure here, which is mainly that of the capitellum. Of course, the trochlea projects as well on top of that. So you have the rounded appearance of both the capitellum and trochlea in opposition or in the same line with the radial head. So you have a radiocapitellar line. Now let's look at the ulna. So if you look at the ulna, you have this pointing projection anteriorly, and this is the coronoid process. And you have this posterior pointing part, which is the olecranon process. What's left in the humerus is a bit easy. Since there is a depression anteriorly for the coronoid process to fit in, 
and the depression posteriorly for the olecranon process to fit in. So this is the coronoid fossa, this is the olecranon fossa. Now that we know the basic anatomy, let's go to the most important part of the discussion for today. When you look at a lateral elbow radiograph, there are four rules that I would like you to follow. These are very important, and if we don't follow those rules, we usually miss things. So the first three rules are what I call the alignment rules. The first rule is to make sure that the lateral elbow radiograph is positioned correctly. To know that, notice how the capitulum and trochlea, which appear rounded here, form what looks like a figure of eight, which is uh, due to the depression anteriorly and posteriorly by the olecranon fossa and the uh, coronoid fossa. Okay, so make sure you have a figure of eight. That's rule number one. Now to rule number two. If you draw a line along the anterior humerus, this line should intersect the mid-third of the capitellum, the rounded structure you're looking at here. If it does not do that, that means that the capitellum is displaced in a wrong way. So to alignment rule number three, this is the easiest. We mentioned that on the frontal radiograph and it's the same for the lateral radiograph. The radial head should always be along the same line with the capitellum. And this is what we call the radio capitellar line that should be maintained in any projection. Let's go to the fourth fact. If you look carefully at this area, you'll notice that there is a darker area of uh, tissue compared to the surrounding soft tissues. Now this darker area that is not as dark as air, but is uh, not as white as soft tissue is the density of fat. Okay, so this is what you see here as fat anterior to the fossa, which we call the coronoid fossa. Since all of this is part of the joint capsule, if there is fluid within the joint, this fat pad would be displaced anteriorly, and it would have an appearance that looks like a triangle or a sail. That's why we would call that a sail sign. So displacement of the anterior fat pad is an abnormal sign that tells you that there is a joint effusion, fluid pushing it anteriorly. The other important fact is that the olecranon fossa is a deep fossa and it also has fat, but because it's deep, you don't see the fat density posteriorly. If you see a posterior fat pad, that means that there is fluid in the joint space pushing the posterior fat posteriorly for you to see it projecting over the soft tissue. So, Seeing the anterior fat pad is okay as long as it's not displaced anteriorly. Seeing the posterior fat pad is not okay. That means a joint effusion by default. Now let's go back to the abnormal case that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, just remember that this is a pediatric patient where some of the structures that we talked about are still in the uh, ossification center stage, meaning that they did not fuse with bones. So let's not be confused by that. What we'll try to do here is to apply the rules that we talked about. Figure of eight, anterior humeral line, radiocapitular line, and assessment of fat pads. Allowing for the non-fusion of the ossification center, you almost have a figure of eight nicely seen here. So that's the first alignment part. Now, if you go to the anterior humeral line, you draw a line that goes anteriorly, you'll notice that the line intersects the anterior third of the capitellum, this here. It should intersect the mid third of the capitellum. That means that the capitellum is displaced. So the capitellum is displaced posteriorly in a way that makes the anterior humeral line pass through the anterior part of this uh, structure. If this is the radius and the radial head, the radiocapitular line is relatively maintained. So that's a line that's not affected. For now, you have one abnormal alignment rule, which is the anterior humeral line. Now let's go to the fat pads. Sometimes these are difficult to see, so you have to adjust the window. But if you look carefully, now you understand what we're talking about. You see this area of lucency that has a triangular appearance or a sail-like appearance. This is actually the sail sign. So this is the anterior fat pad displaced anteriorly by all this density, which is fluid within the joint space, a joint effusion. Not only that, we agree that you should not see a posterior fat pad at all. If you see it, that's always abnormal. 
And if you look carefully, this here is an area of loosened fat that's displaced posteriorly. So there is a positive posterior fat pad as well. You have a joint effusion. We'll not go into details of types of fractures that occur around the uh, elbow joint, but I want you to remember two for now. A joint effusion after trauma in an adult is typically a radial head fracture. A joint effusion in a pediatric patient after trauma is typically a fracture in the supracondylar area. And if you look carefully, you notice that there is this lucent line that disrupts the cortex. It's a very subtle fracture, very difficult to detect if you did not clinically suspect it or if you don't follow the rules on the radiographs. Now let's look at the AP projection on this patient, which is now very well positioned. Uh, it was a difficult pediatric case. However, if you look carefully, knowing what you know from the lateral radiograph, you know that there is a joint effusion and a uh, non-aligned anterior humeral line. And you know in a pediatric case, you will have to look for a fracture above the condyles, and this is what they call a supracondylar fracture. And here's your fracture line again. And now you understand if you don't suspect the fracture, if you don't follow the rules, these are very difficult to uh, assess and they could be easily missed. Just to emphasize the point, here's another pediatric trauma case. This patient is a bit older, but if you try to follow the rules, you notice that you cannot really draw a figure of eight very nicely. This could be due to fracture or could be due to a uh, improper positioning. However, if you look at the anterior humeral line, again, this line passes within the anterior part of the capitulum, not the mid third, so the capitulum is displaced. The radiocapitular line is relatively maintained, but you also have a very positive sign for effusion. The anterior fat pad, which is the sale sign, is very clearly seen here, and a big posterior fat pad, which you should not see. So it's positive for effusion. As we mentioned, if you're seeing these signs in an adult, you think about a radial head fracture. In a pediatric patient, you think about a supracondylar fracture, which you see part of here. To summarize what we talked about today, first, we talked about important anatomical landmarks of the elbow on a frontal and lateral x-ray. Then we talked about four important rules. The first three rules are what we call the alignment rules. The figure of eight, the anterior humeral line, and the radiocapitular line. The fourth rule was that of the fat pad. You may see an anterior fat pad, but not a sale sign. You should never see a posterior fat pad. If those are positive, that's an effusion. If you see any of these abnormalities, especially that of an effusion, in an adult, you have to suspect radial head fractures. In a pediatric patient, you have to suspect supracondylar fractures. They're very difficult to see if you don't keep an open eye. By that, I thank you for watching and hope to see you with more cases.